Rude Awakening is next. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll be speaking to Timothy Greenfield Sanders. His latest film, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am, opens next week. So we're going to talk to him about the film, making it, being friends with Toni Morrison for so many years. And then we're going to switch gears and speak to Phyllis Bowie, community activist who's trying to, who's still trying to save her home in the Fillmore District of San Francisco. We're going to get an update on her fight as well. Stay tuned. Timothy Greenfield Sanders has achieved critical acclaim photographing world leaders and major cultural figures, including presidents, writers, artists, actors, and musicians. His photographs are in many permanent museum collections, and he's also produced 13 documentary films, including Lou Reed, Rock and Roll Heart, The Blacklist, Latino List, The Out List, About Face, Supermodels Then and Now, The Boomer List, The Women's List, The Trans List. He also won a Grammy for the Lou Reed Rock and Roll Heart and an NAACP Image Award for The Black List. And this latest piece, this latest project that he has created, uh, it was his fourth Sundance premiere. And it's entitled Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am. And here to talk about this amazing, amazing documentary, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am, is the filmmaker himself, Mr. Timothy Greenfield Sanders. Mr. Sanders, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Thank you. All right. So it's been uh, 31 years that you've known Toni Morrison. And I tell you, this piece is amazing. It is absolutely beautiful beautifully shot uh the color schemes the 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 approach that you took was amazing and and very poignant and very telling um talk to us about your style as far as doing this particular documentary you locked yourself into this particular style talk about it well it's actually 38 years not 31 Ooh, okay add another seven (laughs) exactly and um you know as a director you try and figure out how to make a film look interesting and different and new and challenging in some way to you. And what I did with Toni Morrison is to have her talk directly to camera, which I had done in my list films, but the other people in the film, the other talking heads, I guess you'd call them, but uh, they all talk off camera uh, about her. So Toni is really telling her story and I think it's very effective. Definitely. And um, I mean, you went through the biggest hits like Sula. Um, you talked about Beloved extensively about Beloved because you also have uh, Oprah Winfrey in it uh, in the documentary as well, um, who played Beloved and brought it to the film. Uh, told that story about how that came to came to fruition. But you didn't talk too much about Tar Baby. Um, there were some things that you ended up leaving out of the documentary. Can you talk about those and why? It's not really a film about Tony's books, per se. It's about Tony's ideas, and it's a film about why she wrote certain books and why she writes the way she does. Mm-hmm. So I didn't feel like I was going to make a film that was a college course in Tony Morrison. <laughs> right. I, I think if you want that, you go to go go to college, or you go to a you know a book club. Sure. Uh, or you. you you share that with other people. Um, that was not my goal. My goal was really to tell about this life that was even uh, a life that so many people didn't even know. The side of Tony that's the single mother, the side of Tony that's a very important editor at Random House, 
the Nobel is extremely important, but it's just a piece of who she is. Mm-hmm. Well, right. And you also left out any real discussion about her, uh, her husband, her, uh, her ex-husband. Um, there wasn't too much discussion about the family life as far as her sons are concerned either. Very patriarchal of you to bring up her husband. <laughs> no, I mean, she she got married. And there was minimal discussion about it. I think it's a part of her life. <laughs> Nothing patriarchal on this side of the, the world. No, not at all. Just wondering, just curious, just straight curiosity. If that's not something she wanted to talk about, can you tell us why? If not, that's fine too. I can tell you why. She's not interested in talking about it. You know, Tony has no interest in. <laughs> talking about her husband. Um, I was with her recently, a few weeks ago, we were signing some posters and she was signing Toni Morrison and she kept saying, I hate that name. And I said, Toni, you know, that, that ship has sailed. And so she signed one poster to me to, uh, to Timothy from Love, Chloe Walford, which is quite special. That's her real name. Right. You know, um, you know she, not, she wasn't interested in uh, talking about that. I don't think that was, I think marriage and the fact that she had children, and we cover that extensively in the film. But, you know, her husband, I guess, was not someone she wanted to be part of this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Understood, understood. But she still kept his name, which I, I found interesting, which is why I definitely well, I think wanted to after, ask. So. No, she not once told at all. Me, Mm-hmm. Yeah, she once told me that she, when she had just finished The Bluest Eye, it was about to be published. She called the publisher and said, I want to change back to my maiden name for, as, my, as the author of this book. And they said it was too late that they had already registered it with the Library of Congress or however you register books. Right. And she's always <laughs> regretted that, she said. Mm, goodness. I Tony Morrison is such a beautiful name as well that, you know, I think it's kind of not a mistake. Definitely not. Definitely not. So how does this compare to, I mean, you, you started off as a photographer, Timothy, right. and uh, you moved into uh, becoming a documentary director. Um and, but how does this particular documentary, uh, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am, compare to your other works? Um, is this like the, the, the piece, the, the pinnacle of your documentary filmmaking career? Or is this uh, another notch on the belt? How does this compare to what you've done in the past? You know, you, you always as an artist want whatever you're doing now to be your greatest and your best. And I feel that way about this film. Mm. Um, I, you know, the, the list films were not really biographies. They were a kind of concept film that I invented, really, talking directly to camera and kind of a cutting style that we used. Um, this film on Tony is more is more like my Lou Reed film. It's a biography. Uh, uh, and so I, it's a much more extensive and comprehensive and complicated thing to do. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. I have to see the Lou Reed one. I, I am I happen to be a fan, so <laughs> I definitely want to check that one out as well. Um, what I loved about this particular one, uh, Toni Morrison, Pieces I Am, uh, which will be opening in San Francisco at the Kabuki Theater on June 28th. That's the AMC Kabuki in San Francisco. Um, is that you take your, your, your photography artistry, your photographic artistry, and you apply it to, of course, this particular uh, film. And it's beautiful. Beautiful. The, the lovely still shots of the water, of yeah. the, the, the house on the water, uh, how it changed over the years. Um, and the way that you, you, you lay together the different interviews that she did from, uh, from the Dick Cavett show on into, to, um, oh gosh, Charlie Rose. Uh, you, you, you lay those and you show the progression as she gets older and, and more beautiful in my eyes, you know. Um, it, how did you work that out as far as um, uh, the symmetry that we see that's displayed in the film? Well, we were very conscious of not having a linear film. We didn't want a film that started, I was born in Lorraine and here I am today living on the river. Right. We went back and forth, we went in the way Tony does. If you look at her novels, they, they move in different directions and the narrator changes, you know, almost instantly sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so we wanted to be free that way. And 
I think it's very effective. I mean, there's luckily for us, there's some tremendous interviews out there. The Bill Moyers piece, the Dick Cavett piece, the Charlie Rose, all all white male interviewers, of course. Yeah. Uh, but they, they were very some very extraordinary things that Tony said. And that was a, that was like gold for us. We also went, you know, Johanna Giebelhaus is the editor. She went out to Lorraine, Ohio and, and met with the Historical Society and the library and found all kinds of great images that no one had ever seen. Pictures of Lorraine from the back in the day when Tony lived there. And we mm-hmm. we also worked with Random House um, and Columbia University and Princeton has Tony's archive, uh, Library of Congress. There's a thousand images in this film and and video and it's you know, it's comprehensive. Yes, yes, indeed it is. It definitely is. Uh, once again, we're speaking to Timothy Greenfield Sanders, and he is the critically acclaimed photo, uh, let's see here, critically acclaimed documentary film maker, photographer turned documentary filmmaker. Uh, some of his films include Lou Reed, Rock and Roll Heart, uh, The Blacklist, The Latino List, The Outlist. Uh, about face supermodels then and now wow it's just all over the place some amazing amazing credits here um very lucky to have you here on a rude awakening we got a few minutes left is there anything in particular about this particular uh documentary about tony morrison called tony morrison the pieces i am that you would like for the viewer to take away i would like to shout out to Micheline Thomas, who's the African American artist who did the opening credits, mm-hmm. which is a magnificent montage of Tony from young Tony to old Tony as the credits uh, come on in the beginning. Also, Catherine Bostic, who is an African American composer based in LA, extraordinarily talented, who composed 95% of the music for the film. and. You, you're also going to see 20, 25 African American artists work. Jacob Lawrence to Carrie James Marshall to Carol Walker to Lorna Simpson. I mean, on and on with pieces of art that we cut to that you don't really see in documentaries very often. So it's it's a very uh, it's a smart, I think, way to use paintings that are more than just illustration. I think they give you a feeling of what's being said. Beautiful. <laughs> and I think it's wonderful. I think you're changing the style of documentary filmmaking, Timothy. I really, really do. And it's for the better, most definitely. <laughs> we would appreciate like <laughs> Yes, yes. We truly appreciate you taking the time. And we look forward to um, hopefully talking to you again in, in the future. Do you have any uh, future projects lined up? And if so, My, can you tell us? <laughs> you know, I, I always... Uh, kind of promote what I'm doing next but I this time I feel like I'm giving all my energy to Tony Morrison yeah. that this is what I've done I've worked for five years on this and I really feel it it needs to be seen by everyone and it's an important film Absolutely. and and she is she is so iconic and meaningful she means so much to so many people That's not right. just the, the African-American community but to just people who who read her work and get something special out of it and who it touches them touches their humanity Mm -hmm. well she's taught a lot she's taught a lot of folks and she keeps teaching folks so we definitely appreciate her and appreciate the effort the five-year effort that you put forth bringing her story to the screen thank you so much for being on a rude awakening thank you Then say it's my country And we are back, and I'm speaking with um, Phyllis Corin Jeannie Bowie, and uh, that's a long name. Um, she is a uh, a resident of San Francisco um, in the Fillmore Midtown area, and she has been fighting for her home. 
she's been fighting for her home against uh, this Mercy Housing. They're trying to to, to take her home and, and the, the home of numerous units in the Fillmore District. Um, they are claiming that the residents don't own their homes anymore. And we've uh, I've talked to her a couple of years ago in regards to this, and she's still fighting the same fight. We've got her on the line right now. Miss Phyllis Bowie, how are you? Thank you so much uh-huh. for doing this. Well, I think a rude awakening. <laughs> yes, yes, and we need a rude awakening as far as what's going on with the housing situation in San Francisco. It has not gotten any better, uh, even with these uh, futile efforts uh, by uh, various organizations like Mercy Housing to, uh, to, to provide affordable housing for people in San Francisco. Um, now, there, we, when I found out or when we first started talking, it's like, oh, Fillmore Midtown. It's like, wait a minute, Fillmore Midtown, you know, th- that's the same area where this urban renewal stuff started. So talk to, uh, us about the, talk to us about that history of that area and then bring it on to the present and what your fight is consisting of now. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm really surprised a lot of people aren't aware of um, Urban Renewal and Justin Herman. But from Urban Renewal started in 1940 to, I think it ended in 1970. And what it basically did was it destroyed the Fillmore and it displaced 10,000 African Americans and destroyed 2,500 Victorians that were black owned. So basically took housing and the people out of Fillmore, historically black. So as kind of a gesture of of economic empowerment and caring for the community, Justin Herman created Midtown. Midtown consists of six buildings, 140 units that were built for ownership. Some of the people that they destroyed their homes, they gave vouchers, and this was one of the places to come. And what is so great about the idea in 1964, it was supposed to be a new model so that people, low-income people, Working class people like we are, medium income people can own and therefore sustain and stay in San Francisco. So that's the history of Midtown. And so we paid off the mortgage. I'll fast forward to paying off the mortgage in 2007. After we paid off the mortgage, the city decided they were not going to give us ownership. So that's when we went on rent strike and we started, everybody knows us from the streets and protesting and please, please, please don't, don't destroy our home. So one of the great things I love to bring good news is that we did win that they won't do any demolition, which was what they wanted to do for the last four years. And so no demolition. Yay. So instead right now what's happening due to the city's neglect, there's over $90 million worth of repairs and, and renovations that need to be done. Mm-hmm. So what the city decided to do was to give the property to Mercy Housing as a developer for them to develop it, take on that burden of the loan, and develop it I'm using public, sta- public housing standards. So that's basically where we stand today. Okay, so Mercy Housing was given this contract, so to speak, by the city of San Francisco, correct? Correct. Okay, and so that was done back when Gavin Newsom was mayor, right? Yeah. Okay, so where how how is Mercy trying to move forward in evicting you all, uh, sticking these uh, pretty much worthless vouchers in your face and telling you to be on your merry way? It doesn't make any sense. Talk to us about how Gavin Newsom's administration factored in or fa- factors in still to uh, what's happening now. Well, one of the things that we relied on for a long time was there was a resolution. When we paid off the loan, there was a resolution that was... Um, inked by Ross Mercurini, who at that time was our fifth district supervisor. And it was signed by all the board of supervisors and also signed by, at the time, Mayor Gavin Newsom. So once the city started saying, we're going to give this to Mercy, 
to develop and we're going to give them ownership is when we brought up the resolution and said, hey, what about this resolution where it points out that the residents are supposed to own and it gives guidelines. Well, the city said that um, that was not a legally binding document. A resolution is not. And therefore, they changed their mind and they can give the property to whoever they want to. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. So this is um, legal theft, it sounds like to me. You know, to, to really put it succinctly, it sounds like legal theft. It's, it's, what are what is the recourse that you can take the, uh, the residents of uh, of the Fillmore Midtown uh, buildings area? What can you do? How are you fighting? What what what's going on as far as, you know, fighting the good fight and keeping a roof over your head, for goodness sake? Oh, thank you for asking. There's actually two things. Um, one of us, I just am so proud of the families here and how we've stuck together. And it's a predominantly African-American family uh, um, um, residence and also it's 80 percent women. So what we're doing now. And so this is something that actually the listeners, if you're interested, can join us. So because they're applying for for planning, this is Mercy Housing Development. They are required to have a, a public meeting. And the public meeting is for them to show what their plan is for repairing Midtown. And that happens this Tuesday, the 18th. So that's tomorrow, the 18th at 630 at Hamilton Rec Center, which is 1900 Gary Boulevard. So one of the things we're planning to do at that meeting so that it's on record is that we want the state of the art repairs and renovation and we want it to be preserved And we want the community to come in to hear how the city's responding to us saying that we don't want minimal, which is what they're going to propose, put a Band-Aid on things, paint a few things. Um, And what we want is we want it to be state of the art. We want it to be beautiful. We want to have solar power. You know, we want to have sustainable, non-toxic materials. And so that is something that anybody listening, if you want to just come and join us and have a voice about at least what the future of Midtown looks like. That's one of the things we're doing. The second thing that we're doing is, is actually I came up with an idea since the city is not going to give us it, not going to give us the property. And they're definitely moving forward to giving the property to Mercy. They did tell us, hey, you know what? Actually, you can have ownership. And I'm going to take a pregnant pause. Take a pause. (laughs) If you can find the money which, which is estimated $90 million within like the next 30 days before we give it to Mercy, then you can actually have the property. So, like, what do you do to that? <laughs> like, I just laugh. Isn't that kind of like a Trojan horse saying, yeah, we can give you ownership knowing that the working mm-hmm. class community is not going to be able to afford it. But I came up with a brilliant idea, you guys. What about we ask Google, Salesforce, any of those right. corporations to sponsor the $90 million rehab and let the city give us the deed. And therefore, it sustains economic um, empowerment for the black community. It will grow the very dwindling black community in San Francisco, and especially in a traditional historical Fillmore. It used to be called the you know, Harlem of the West. That's right. That's right. Other things, it's like, oh my God, that would be so great if we could get a sponsorship. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? I, you know, to say that uh, there isn't enough money in San Francisco f- to make this happen, you know, that would be a big lie. I mean, so many of those folks that work down there in Silicon Valley, they wait for their air conditioned, uh, Wi Fi uh, 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 installed buses right there in Skid Row, right there in Civic Center to go take them away to their cushy job, you know, and they come back to San Francisco to their cushy apartments. These folks make hand over fist bank, okay? What is a couple hundred thousand dollars from about 10 of them, maybe 20 of them, you know, to to help out, you know, to help out the the, the lower income people who have been there, 
for years, who have been in the San Francisco area, in San Francisco proper for years. Um, we've got a few minutes left here. Miss Phyllis yeah. Bowie is a community yeah. activist. She is right here on A Rude Awakening, breaking it down and, and giving us a rude awakening about what's still going down in San Francisco. We've got a few more minutes left. What else do you want folks to know about as far as your struggle is concerned? And as far as this meeting is concerned, tomorrow, Tuesday, the 18th, uh, at the Hamilton High School. Hamilton, Hamilton Rec Center at 6.30. Rec Center, uh, sorry, yeah, Rec Center. And that's really the seat so that you can hear firsthand what the city's planning to do. As far as my brothers and sisters that are new to the area, that are young and happy to have a job in Silicon Valley and come into our communities and take their air-conditioned buses and bring their monies back into the city, what I'm asking you to do, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons and the Salesforce employees, all you have to do is pick up the phone and call your community philanthropic department. Every corporation has one. And you just say, we are interested in giving fellowship and sponsorship to Midtown Park Apartments, where we catch the bus right across the street on Divisadero and Gary. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of the last thing I want to say besides the meeting on Tuesday, tomorrow at 630, Hamilton Rec. But a bigger issue is how do we solve this? Mm -hmm. How do we grow the black population as homeowners? as homeowners so that we can be sustainable and be proud and grow our families right here in the heart of the Fillmore. And I'm saying, why not let the corporate sponsorship that has bought so much to the city as far as financial benefits now contribute to the culture, which is what we're lacking. So I will end on that. (laughs) Yeah. For the culture of everybody, not just African-American folks. The culture of San Francisco that needs to have African Americans present in restaurants and walking down the streets and mm. you know right. paying property taxes. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Say that. Do it for the culture. And that's the multiculture. That is what yeah. is up. That is what is up. Phyllis yeah. Bowie. Phyllis, you've got the most amazing name here. I gotta look it up to make sure I get it right. Phyllis Corinne Jeannie or Jeannie if you're from France. <laughs> Bowie. <laughs> Community <laughs> activist laid it down, letting folks know what is up um, right here on A Rude Awakening. So, uh, yeah, tomorrow, 1900, uh, where's the Hamilton Rec Center again? Yeah, yes, it's uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, the 18th, and it is 1900 Gary Boulevard, and that is the Hamilton Rec Center. Also, you can contact us at www.save midtown.org or on facebook save midtown all right save midtown.org or on facebook save midtown phyllis Bowie breaking down thank you so much for being on the show my dear thank you have a good day everybody yeah appreciate you And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guests, Timothy Greenfield Sanders and Phyllis Bowie, for taking the time. The lovely Lucrecia Burton is on the controls. I'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Hard Dark Radio is up next. Have a wonderful week of resistance, community. And thank you for listening. local station board election is underway. A donation of $25 by June 30th gives you the right to vote. Want to do more than donate? 
consider running as a candidate to serve on your local station board. Visit elections.pacifica.org and cast your candidacy by completing the nomination package before June 30th. E-ballots will be issued to members with an email. Members in need of a paper ballot can email nes at pacifica.org or leave a voicemail at 510-854-9663 indicating their full name, address, and telephone number. Please help make this election green by filling out a ballot request form on elections.pacifica.org indicating the email you would like us to use to send you a ballot. Ballots go out August 15, 2019. And it is 4 o'clock here at KPFA 94.1 FM in Berkeley, KFC 